So um, now we're back and I'm joined by Jorge Cuevas, who is the Chief Coffee Officer for Sustainable Harvest Coffee Importers. Jorge started his journey in coffee in the mid 1990s in his native Mexico as an exports manager for a coffee cooperative or for coffee cooperatives in Oaxaca. And his experiences in coffee include production, processing, export, import, price risk management, and final product development. So a lot of things. Um, we invited Jorge here today to have a sort of semi-structured conversation about how to understand the events of this present moment in the context of the past 30 years or um, or even you know beyond that. So because the company that he works for, uh, Sustainable Harvest is known for a commitment to fostering relationships between coffee buyers and um, and coffee sellers with a, a view to the long term. Um, and Jorge has been working closely with some of the cooperatives and producers that they source coffee from for decades. Um, we thought he'd be a great person to talk to. Uh, as always, I hope that you'll add your voice to the conversation by using the chat window. And um, I think we can you know, go ahead with our, our conversation. So Jorge, thank you so much for being here. It's really nice to see you. Thank you, Kim. Always, always a pleasure talking to you and connecting with all of our friends in the coffee world. Yeah. Um, so I am going to start out with a couple of questions that I have, but like I said, you know, we'll take questions as we have been, and uh, and we've had some really good ones over the course of the day. I said that during the last session, but I've been really, um, really pleased with how broad the interests are of this audience. Um, so, given that you've been working in coffee for, you know, more than twenty years, let's say, um, I wonder whether you see the complexity and the uncertainty that we're experiencing right now as you know, as, as truly unprecedented, because I've heard that a lot, you know, like this is unprecedented, we've never seen anything like it. Um, or if this is one of those cases where the specialty coffee industry has sort of a short memory. I think, you know, we've seen that before too. Sure, sure, no. Um, well, I, I would answer first and then we'll, we'll review what, how we come up with the answer. No, it is genuinely, truly unprecedented. Um, it's just the confluence of factors has no point of reference for any of us. And that's important to recognize as we face the challenges. So what do we mean by those confluence of factors? Everything starts with the pandemic. What is it, a once in a generation, even once in two generations or even three, right? The pandemic has turned the world upside down completely and has brought all kinds of challenges to absolutely everybody in the world and obviously within our coffee universe. So we start with that, which we're already, what, a year and a half into it and, and no end in sight, right? It's still it seems there's improvements and then we go back and it continues the challenge. Then earlier in this year, we started to see particularly in North America for our US um, guests here, uh, rising costs, labor issues, obviously COVID restrictions, uh, guidelines, workplace uh, um, fundamentals that are shifting and changing. So all of those rising costs were starting to affect industry throughout. Then that elevated to logistics. It started with local logistics, transportation, um, energy prices, energy costs, accessibility, um, ports. Uh, we've all seen those images, right, uh, of ports and, and vessels waiting outside. And then the logistics issue becomes global. Transshipment, origin ports, uh, missed vessels, uh, routes that used to take 21 days, now take three months, even four. So planning all around that. And just if that wasn't enough, I mean, think about all of those three things that we talked about. And if that wasn't enough, only about a month or so ago, a few weeks ago, we had a frost in Brazil, which just through volatility and pricing through crazy levels in a matter of minutes and days. Just for reference, the last time there was a frost, it was 1994, almost 30 years, 27 years ago. And of course, it had to happen this year just to spice it up a little bit more. So sure, it's completely unprecedented. It's all at once. So nobody should feel too bad about it. The challenges are affecting all of us in, in different or perhaps equal measures, but we're not alone. We have our industry, we have our networks to support ourselves, but the keys, yes, the challenges can feel overwhelming and we just need to navigate through them, but there's no precedent for it. You brought up something that I've been thinking about and, um, and I hope that this doesn't sound like a a provocative question because they don't mean it that way but you know it feels like one of the things that makes this unprecedented is like you're saying that everyone is sort of experiencing these challenges versus this narrative where producers are challenged you know as it seems like 
that's become familiar to us. Do you think that here, I mean, are we at risk of sort of forgetting about the, you know, what we've known for the past 30 years, which is that it's challenging to produce coffee? Or do you think that this might actually bring people to a greater understanding across the value chain because we have this shared stress? Yeah, I, I believe in the latter. Uh, I, I tend to be more optimistic in, in nature. No, but why is so that? Optimistic. <laughs> Thank you. But but it has to be fundamental <laughs> behind that. it, right? Yeah. It's, otherwise, it's just dreaming. That's not the point, and that's not particularly useful. So you're right, right? We 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 came from four and a half, almost five years of very low average coffee prices, which were specifically hurting the the, the producer side of the equation. At the same time, almost in parallel, the coffee industry uh, in, in consuming countries. Is, is booming, is becoming fashionable, whatever, we're in the third or in the fourth wave, innovation, cold drinks, nitro, uh, cold brew itself, eh, all of these great innovations, you know, formats for consumption. So a tremendous, so there was a divergence. Now, I believe this is time to reset. This is hurting absolutely everybody all at once. So this allows us to reset, to breathe a little and say, okay, how do we go forward as an industry, so for sure. For growers, we, people may say, okay, well, prices are higher now. Yeah, I was talking to Brazilian friends and they said, well, that's no consolation because I lost 40% of my crop. So what good does that do, right? So um, let's keep in mind that our prices are here because of a uh, crisis in Brazil, a production crisis, which is very acute, very difficult. Also rising costs, getting through all of the COVID restrictions and guidelines and be safe the way we should all be. But just talking to Nicaraguan millers just yesterday, and then half the staff rotation. Some people are sent home. You come back. They need to properly test guidelines. So that's production and costs are rising. But in the consumer side, as we spoke earlier, the logistics and costs are rising tremendously. It's very difficult to plan. It's very difficult to manage inventories. It's very difficult to project what you're going to need at any given point in time, even with consumption patterns coming and going, big shifts. So yes, I, I do believe this is going to, I think we're going to come out stronger. What That's what they say, right? If we come out of crisis and we survive crisis, we do come out stronger. So I think there's going to be a better sense of, of a greater sense of community, of cohesiveness. And you know, after we go through tough times, then the new tough times just don't seem as tough. And these are truly, truly hard. So we come out and I think we're going to be better prepared, better willing to even put sacrifices and put forward tough decisions that just make us be better as an industry as a whole. Yeah. You know, you said something right there about how this current moment is the product of a, a crisis. You know, the uh, commodity futures market goes up for coffee, but um, then you talk to people in Brazil and they've lost 40% of, of their crops. So it's not really a moment for celebration. It's just a different kind of crisis. And um, and I wonder if that's the sort of answer or that's the um, foundation for an answer to a question we got from the audience from Dylan who asks, if the current New York sea price due to frost and these other factors is not a positive impact, doesn't have a positive impact. Um, how do you see that? Or how do you see producers outside of Brazil um, right. if thinking about this moment in, in the context of that market price? Correct. So understanding, yes. Yeah, so isolating Brazil and, and recognizing it, it does come from crisis. You know, it's not like any of us did anything great to solve the price crisis. It came by a, by a, by a climate effect. But true, in the rest of the producing countries, it is a time for opportunity, unquestionably, even though costs have risen, but not at the same rate that the price has. Um, and, you know, there is the outlook in Brazil remains, uh, you know, open to, to the effects of these, these harvest season or the next, but it is expected that prices will remain at around these levels for a certain period of time. So it is the moment to invest in coffee. It is true opportunity. I was at an Ana Cafe event in Guatemala a couple of weeks ago, uh, of course, virtual. Um, and uh, and the, the, the theme was to growers and to producers, time to reinvest in your farm, trying to reactivate your plots that maybe had been left behind or, or there was truly no ability to invest before, but this is a moment on time. So we cannot waste the opportunity. It is, it is a truly, a moment in which it can have positives in other areas of the world for other growers. And the fact that also consumption, and we can touch on that a little later, and I'm sure you've talked about it, it hasn't been hurt as much. The pandemic started huge uncertainties over are people gonna have even the income or the interest to continue to consume coffee? 
Now we have data and it's a resounding yes. Sure, different channels perhaps, different formats of consumption, but coffee, we're blessed by being in the coffee industry in that it has withstood one of the most difficult crises in humanity in, the, in recent memory. So yeah, it is a time for opportunity. And for all those growers not affected by those climatic effects, investment is the time is right. Go and reactivate your plots of land, re-engage with the industry because this, this can be positive for you and your communities and your families. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is definitely a reason for optimism. Looking back and seeing what the predictions were a year ago and seeing how you know we're so far from resolving COVID, we're so far from resolving the coffee price crisis, as you note. But um, but at the same time, we were expecting things to be a lot worse when it came to the you know retail side and consumption side. So and that is good good reason to be optimistic. Um, I also I'm thinking about the audience for this event and um, and who I've seen participating in the chat. And there are a lot of producers, but I know that there are also a lot of people in kind of buying roles or on the buying side of coffee. And um, because you work with producers and organizations in so many places, I wonder if you have um, questions that come up again and again, you know, that producers are asking, maybe in part because there's not a great network connecting people to each other, because there's a lack of opportunities for in-person networking or, um, you know, information gathering. Like, what are some of these questions that you personally as chief coffee officer or you all as a, an importer are being asked by um, some of these, you know, some of these producers who you've had relationships for long enough that they probably are in a position to feel safe asking you these questions. For sure, for sure. No, very, very uh, good question. And it has, the themes have evolved a little bit over time since let's just say the start of the pandemic, March, April of 2020. It started with a key question of economic uncertainty. What's going to happen? What is going to happen in the world? What is going to happen with the economies? Now, nobody knew, of obviously. Um, but at first it was simply, what are we gonna do with our crop? The harvest, as we all know, doesn't wait. Coffee doesn't wait. We need to find a home for our coffee. So how are we gonna address that? Um, throughout the, the early days of, or mid-2020, mid, uh, it was very difficult because people were reshuffling their inventories and we ourselves and many others were facing growers to say, look, we cannot buy any more, more coffee at the moment and we need to delay what we have planned, right? We need to push back. And that created a lot of distortion. And growers just came back and said, okay, will you still buy my coffee? We engaged in a lot of conversations. Once things settled down a little bit towards late summer, early fall, at least in the US and in, in Canada, um, we were able to engage with, with, with growers and they asked the same question, will you still buy our coffee? And it was a resounding yes. I mean, the amount of commitment to, to sources and to relationships is very strong in specialty coffee, and we all need to be proud of that. So that was one of the key questions. The second one, and which was more interesting and actually harder to, to address at first, was, is my coffee, is the coffee that I grow still relevant? Everybody recognized that there had been a major shift in the consumption patterns, in the consumption channels, the away from home, the, the, the workplace consumption, the university or college consumption went to almost zero and everything was shifted to the home or to the kiosks, drive-throughs, takeout style of consumption. But that meant a shift in the actual coffees that were used. And many growers said, hey, I produce high-end specialty coffee. Will people still care about this? Because what if there's an economic crisis and people just want value coffee, right? Um, and, and all of those key questions came about. Over time, we were able to show data that said that the economy has held up okay with, with tremendous ups and downs, but has held up okay, at least in, in, in some countries. And again, the, the love of coffee, the fact that coffee is a part of your morning routine stayed with us and it stayed with everybody. So sure, it was a different style of coffee perhaps, but people were entertaining new ideas, new coffee uh, preparations, uh, and then besides going through their, their, their takeout or their app-based consumption or even the coffee clubs, right? The, the, the clubs, the subscriptions in which you get a different coffee style every two weeks or every week, however often. So we were able to answer to say, yes, high-end specialty coffee is healthy and it is sound, actually maybe even healthier than ever, which I would not have predicted. I honestly didn't think so. 
But innovation, distinction, differentiation matters. So that was also a relief for people who had invested for years in infrastructure and planning. And all of us were saying, oh, innovate, process, the processing revolution. It sounded great. And then what if nobody's there to buy the coffee, right? I mean, people can go bankrupt in a snap. But thankfully, that isn't happening as much. So those are the key questions. People you say, well, you still buy my coffee. Is my coffee still relevant? That matters a lot. But the, the hardest one is now, it's about the medium term, about uh, projecting mm -hmm. or planning, giving some visibility into what's ahead. And none of us really can predict that. Um, it's common practice to try to give growers guidance. Uh, this is the harvest plan. This is what we would project based on historicals. The historicals are now <laughs> not useless, but not as useful as before. So it is tough. It is tough in that regard. And that is the question that remains unanswered. And I'm not sure we'll be able to answer anytime soon is can you give us any certainty or the ability to provide visibility into the months ahead? I think all of us understand why and why that is. But um, um, the, I guess those are the key the key takeaways. And so the message to our guests here, if you're a grower, just engage with your supply chain. And in the consumption side, make sure you communicate your intent. Even if you are breaking bad news, if you bought two containers and now you can only buy one, we understand that, but then communicate that. Say, you know, uh, but I'm still with you. Um, I'm loyal to your relationship. We'll buy that one container or however much you can buy. Um, that That is the key because growers are sitting... I mean, imagine that, right? I mean, their, their markets are foreign, they're outside, they receive news. We all know what the news does, right? News isn't always perfectly objective and a perfect reflection of reality. So it's hard to make sense of it all. Um, so the key is that you become the source of their information and not just other sources that may be less reliable. Yeah, I feel like you, um, you're sort of uh, planting seeds for topics that we're going to be talking about in presentations later today and uh, tomorrow when we go into the more kind of specific characteristics of the um, of these different consuming markets. Um, but one thing that you note that, you know, the market overviews that we'll do tomorrow, a lot of that is based on data that is, you know, not fully updated uh, to reflect the past year of consumption. So um, I would also just uh, note for anyone here, especially on the, the growing or production side, who is curious about some of those in the moment responses to COVID by uh, retailers and roasters um, to check out the COVID survey um, results or the results of the COVID surveys that the SCA did. My A couple of my colleagues, including Katie, who just hosted, um, did presentations for the Coffee Retail Summit a few months ago and um, that just give that sort of um, here's where we are right now. It doesn't, can't predict the future, but it's probably going to be at least a good counterpart to the aggregated data from, you know, 2018 or 2019 that's all been analyzed, but uh, reflects a, a world that was pretty different than the world we're in now. Exactly. So sort of putting these things together, we can piece together sort of the, the picture um, of where we are and hopefully make better decisions for the, um, for the future. But I want to go back to this uh, market piece that we were talking about a few minutes ago, because um, a question from the audience is, uh, is really interesting to me. Kevin asks, um, if there is any commodity-based industry that was previously pegged to the market, like C market, that has fully moved into a different economic model, any examples out there in other futures-based agricultural industries that are seen as producer-focused? This is probably, I know it's a little bit outside my area of expertise, but it's an interesting idea. And so I at least want to air it on the, um, yeah. in the conversation. It's a phenomenal question. It's a phenomenal question. And the one that all of us have struggled with, right? Is the sea market a villain? Is it a necessary evil? Is it who we are or, or anything in between? No, we won't dispel that one in particular today. It would take too long if, if it's even possible. What, what matters is to understand what causes commoditization, right? It, so, Industry, once it reaches a certain scale of any kind, think cotton, think uh, almonds, think any other product that is a primary product or a raw material that will go through a transformation. You know, I like to use cotton as a good example because there's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a healthy supply chain by many, many, many standards. So we can feel better about that. We'll have another but, summit on that another exactly. time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But but industry will always tend to commoditize. Okay. So commoditization is just simply putting 
an, an orderly set of standards around it and to standardize everything because bigger industry loves standardization. Just, you know, one or two units, not many variables. Everything comes in a prepared package in a preset way. And then they can handle their volumes and their volumes and their volumes of that. So how do, so commoditization is not something that can be stopped. It's just a natural, think about the systematization, standardization. I and mean, in some ways it can be healthy, right? It gives- Yeah, it's not all bad to be, yeah. to have substitutes for things. Exactly, you know? exactly. But within that standardization, those who, who have a higher standard should be able to find room for differentiation. So those two are not one or the other. I think they can coexist. Again, if we go back to other products like say olive oil, or if we go to wine, right? You have generics and then you have highly specialized ones. So you work for differentiation. One of the best examples to the question specifically, you know, you think of small growers, which in coffee, most of the coffee farmers in the world are small holders, right? So that's an interesting thing that we need. It's in our nature, it's their DNA. We need to recognize that. So one of the best examples of small holder differentiation and success in a highly commoditized industry has been wine growers in Germany. Wine growers in Germany, they have small plots of land. There's a lot of them. They work collectively, much like cops who work here, and they work to differentiate their product as much as they possibly can. The same with the olive oil people in Italy and in all the other industries, in, in, in the, the olive oil industry. So the way is just to, to show yourself why you're different genuinely, to put forward a higher quality product, and then there's a market for that. So my end message is the coexistence of standardization and differentiation can live well. It, you, you, you can work with different market segments. Both can be healthy and both are acceptable, but you do need to get organized. You need to be strong in your marketing. You need to be strong in your quality standards because you do need to be distinctively better than the standard for that distinction and the thickness to be successful. So going forward, I think that's the best way to understand it, to say we can coexist, but differentiation is something we're gonna to have to fight for and it's not a given because the natural tendency of big scale economics will tend us to the other way. So you have to fight, get ideas, get energy, get focus, but it can be done. And there's many examples in coffee included where that can be done. I gotta say, I'm a little bit skeptical of the wine growers in Germany, though I don't know very much about small wine growers in Germany. That seems like, you know, one small example versus on the scale that you all are thinking and working, you know, and everyone in this audience, we're talking about growers in so many different places. But at the same time, I do also see that specialty coffee has really demonstrated that differentiation is, can be good and valuable. You know, um, and the to go back to your answer to the last question, you know, the clear communication around what attributes are valuable to you as a buyer. And then also on the producer side, the kind of clear understanding of the attributes that your coffee has seems like, you know, it may be at a much greater scale or we might be talking about a lot of different kinds of um, differentiated coffees versus one way of differentiating in a group of German wine producers, but um, I do at least I do agree that there's a there's something there, um, and that it seems like technology can facilitate that. You know, at this point, we have technology that um, has enabled a lot of connections. I'm sure it, it feels in some ways quite different, or you wouldn't have been able to imagine it in the '90s. Um, the way that we are convening a global group for um, a summit like this and I'm I'm really thankful for all that technology has given us. Um, but I also see that, you know, there are still some really significant gaps as evidenced by the questions that you all are getting. And back to the opening presentation that I gave, the questions that we were getting during COVID. And I wonder if we risk overestimating the um, role that technology can play in changing the fundamental structures of coffee trading. Sure. Well, so technology like many others is is a tool, right? and a tool that can be used in both directions for, for good or for less than good, perhaps even evil. Um, in our case, in coffee, I don't think anybody uses it for evil. I hope it stays that way. <laughs> it's a subject for another summit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but the thing about technology is that it has allowed us a lot of access. And we think this, this, is the, this is the misnomer. People think, oh, I have a lot of access to information. I actually refute that. 
people have a lot of access to data, but do they actually have, or do we all really have access to information? Something that is valuable, that is actionable, that has been synthesized to its essence to give me the actual tools to say, oh, I have a decision to make, or I can make this and this decision. Obviously forums like this one are the perfect example of how you're turning data into information, what is valuable to growers. So my message and my comment really on technology is to make a clearly discerning separation between data and information that is valuable and to use our trusted networks, either human <laughs> or virtual, whatever they may be, to validate all of those pieces because there's nothing worse than believing that you have information that is either slanted or that has been dated or that is just no longer relevant or has been irresponsibly published or whatever reason. And in this day and age, anybody can publish anything anywhere. There's no longer credentials. There's no longer a certain curriculum you have to be. Everybody is published every day, every second, every moment, every hour. So um, the key is simply to, to not believe everything, to do your own research, to dig deeper and to rely on your sources, in your network, in your peers, to validate and come up with the best ways to say, ah, that is valuable. That is something that I can act upon and it gives me ideas of what I need to do strategically with my coffee business. Yeah. I think we only have time for one more question. And I want to pick up on that, you know, that difference between data and information to ask a question about um, about transparency and the perception of transparency. Because, you know, over the past decade, we've seen specialty coffee roasters and importers and I don't know, maybe others, maybe retailers, um, starting to publish the prices that they pay for coffee, especially at the sort of FOB moment. And I wonder if, um, in particular for you all, if your suppliers, uh, although I'd be curious about your, you know, roaster buyer partners too, but you know, if they come to you with questions about what the what this data means um, and how you know they should understand it, uh, or whether they should be prepared to engage with it somehow or engage in a conversation with consumers about this uh, about this data. Sure. So first off, I think transparency is always healthy. So let's start with that premise. Any step we take towards greater transparency can only be a good thing. Having said that, the information that we convey, it needs context. It needs to be placed in this proper, full understanding so as to not fall into misunderstandings. A very common, very, very, very common feeling somebody may publish, uh, you know, a $2.50 a pound. May or may not be a good FOB price, but it's around where things are today. So $2.50 a pound for X specialty coffee, FOB. And then anybody can now check their phone or anywhere and you realize that a pound of coffee in the supermarket, specialty grade, is going to be $17, $18, or $19. So they're like, whoa, right? So without proper context, $2.50 FOB price looks pathetically low when the same, is it the same? It's not the same, but a pound of coffee at a supermarket level is you know, five times, six times that value. Of course, we all know, and SEA has done a tremendous job uh, of, of showing the transparently what the added costs are of putting a final roasted product pound in a supermarket shelf where a consumer can pick it up. But that's why I say context. So every time uh, I always say transparency is healthy and is good, but it needs to be uh, managed responsibly, meaning you need to provide all its full context. Otherwise, it can actually backfire and provide resentment, provide a misalignment, and provide a, an idea of a price that is not in. The other example is when they publish the prices for auctions. Well, that's great. I mean, I want every grower to earn $100 per pound award one day. Wouldn't that be awesome? But is that truly a reflection of coffee, right? And all of the winners get all of the attention. And there may be 300 samples submitted, and there were five winners. And those five winners made a great, great price. And it's great, and it's published, and it's transparent, so we all see but perhaps it should be understood that that was 0.01% of the total of any given point in time. So nobody feels like, oh, I'm missing out. Why am I still getting 250 when somebody's getting, no, let's not say 100, but let's just five or seven or $10 per pound because that was sure. auction or that was a competition or any kind of that. So all of those efforts, I reiterate, it's healthy. It's always good that we have transparency, but it needs to be accompanied with its full context to be properly understood. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, what I hear you saying is that this is this is a really great tool and we need to use it and also know how to use other tools. You know, whether those are very familiar tools, the in-person kind of relationship building and trust building that we've been doing, you know, since the beginning of the coffee trade to new tools, you know, um, things that technology offers us, um, virtual conferences, what have you, but that um, it isn't just about finding the best tool. Um, it's about using all of them. Of course. Yep. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our time. It flew by. But um, Jorge, I really appreciate that you took your time and you know sort of brought this level of candor to the conversation. It's really, um, it's really refreshing. Always great to hear your perspective. Thanks for having me. Always great talking to you, Kim. All the best.